Welcome to the Experienced Focused Leaders. I am delighted uh, to introduce you to one of my role models, Godard Abel. Godard is a co-founder and CEO of G2, which is uh, revolutionizing the way uh, buyers discover, um, learn about, and buy software. Uh, but he's also a five-time CEO with exits uh, uh, to companies like Salesforce and Oracle with a very strong perspective and unique perspective on how to lead and build great enduring companies. Uh, so just fascinating conversation. I can't wait to get started. Godard, tell us a little bit about your journey towards uh, G2. Right, because we are, you know, we, we our audience loves uh, to create great buyer experiences. I think you started and had a vision for that back in 2012, I want to say. Uh, so you were kind of on the cutting edge of, of that. And you've obviously had previous experiences in, in promoting and building software companies. So I share, share with us that uh, story. Yeah, no, thanks, Alex. Great to be here with you. And it's also been fun to be part of your journey. I think we've gotten to know each other maybe six or seven years ago. I remember when Relato was just in its infancy. And obviously amazing to see you also growing. And uh, obviously most excited, you now have 266 happy Relato reviews on G2. And that's really why we built G2. You know, we want to make it easier for software buyers to discover innovative technologies. And, you know, the ones that will really help their business forward. And I think in this age of software and AI, I think the success of any knowledge worker, any business is so dependent on software. And I think we all saw the pandemic only accelerated this, you know, but as knowledge workers, we're all in apps all day long. Like right now you and I are on a Zoom and probably during my day, I use like 20 different apps. Mm. And I think that's what we're all doing. And so that was really the founding vision of G2, software is eating the world. And you really need a buffet, if you will, but you need one you can trust. And I think what was missing, you know, when we started at the beginning, we called it Yelp for business software. Yeah. And, you know, but that whole idea that we take for granted as B2C consumers, you know, shopping on Amazon, we can quickly discover the products we love. Amazon recommends products and we can always check out reviews, you know, from other customers, users. And that was just missing in software. And that traditional model of Gartner, Forrester analysts, you know, while they're smart people, you know, like doing primary research, one person doing the research, publishing a book or a quadrant every two years. We just didn't think could keep up with the innovation. In my own experience as a software entrepreneur, I've been building software companies for 25 years. And I always saw my customers struggle to discover apps. Right. And my first company, I remember, especially big machines, and we were building, you know, what you might call like a niche CPQ configure price quote app for manufacturers. And it took us many years of struggle, you know, to build it into a successful business. But eventually we signed up companies like G Energy, or Rolls Royce, they made truly big machines, big turbines. And I remember they would discover big machines and they'd say, Hey, I wish we'd found you two years ago. Right. Yeah, you know, we've been trying to build this software in-house. We didn't even know it existed. And so we just saw that, you know, software buyers, they couldn't find the apps that would best solve their business problems. And obviously, us as software sellers, entrepreneurs, we were really frustrated and we didn't want to wait. It took us nine years to get a garden report, nine years of big machines, and I think 12 years to become the leader. And honestly, as an entrepreneur, do you want to wait 12 years to be validated, Alex? Well, I, it, and it's interesting, right? Back in the days when you were selling large ticket items, enterprise software, maybe we, you could kind of settle for some of that, right? Like the like it takes a while to build the software and so on. But the world has changed, right? We've talked a little bit about AI. Yeah, we'll come back to that. But, you know, we're moving to people wanting to, uh, really experience the software, see the value of the software, hear live videos of customers talking about it, right, right in the process of discovering and defining their criteria. So can you tell us a little bit about the buyer expectations? Kind of how do you think they've changed, even since you found it, um, you know, already on the original premise since you found it, G2? Yeah. And I do think buyer expectations for software buyers have really changed, Alex, and they keep changing. And I think that original vision we had is going to be more consumer-like. And I think what you're pointing out, yeah, it includes like just signing up for free, trying products. And I think most of the innovators in the software industry over the last decade, that's how they go to market. You know, like one company that comes to mind, HubSpot, I think over 50% of their customers are truly self-serve. 
And I think also that model HubSpot helped pioneer like an inbound funnel, like, hey, just educate your prospect for free. Don't put all your learning content behind paywalls. Let them, you know, let the buyer buy the way we want to buy, right? And none of us when we're buying stuff, we don't want to go like through a paywall or go through like, hey, sign up and get barrage until we're ready. You know, so I think that whole idea of consumer first, give the buyer the experience they want, allow them to educate themselves. And I think even Gartner says, you know, 80 to 90% of the buying decision is now made online mm -hmm. or they'll even reach out to you. And so I think as a seller, you know, it's up to us to provide that great buying experience, educate the buyer gradually with great content, you know, that's free to consume and then allow them to sign up for a trial and then, you know, raise their hand and talk to your salesperson when they're ready. I just think that's, that's what the modern buyer expects. And even like, you know, the more in a recent disruptors like Snowflake, I think you can also like as an engineer, you can just sign up for free, you know, start playing with their data lakes or data clouds. And if you love the tooling, you know, eventually you bring it to the CIO and you say, Hey, let's sign up enterprise wide, but that's not how you start. You know, it's that bottoms up consumer like motion. And I do think that's only accelerated over the last 10 years. And I do think AI is only going to accelerate it more because I think what chat GPT has shown right now, we can really easily educate ourselves on any topic and the internet already made that possible. Like with search, but search is still a bit clunky. You have to know what you're searching for and browse through like 20 websites. And the beauty of Chat GPT, Bard, they sort of synthesize everything for us. And we just asked a question that, you know, we just, what do we want to learn? And it synthesizes all the information available in the world for us. And I do think the same thing we're aiming to do with our AI Monty, synthesize all the information on software, including all the millions of reviews. And the challenge, once you have millions of reviews, we have over 2,000 categories, no human can process all that. that right right exactly whereas ai you know these these gpt engines they're really perfect at digesting tons of information and then just pulling out the data the reviews the insights we want you know based on our questions and so i think it's yeah i think it's pretty revolutionary for obviously all online apps and information sources including g2 and so the the kind of the other dimension that i i think you know, has come up in broadly in the society, but obviously in the software world is that, you know, I think it's being over marketed, right? Like it's sort of like, here's our PowerPoint and how great we are. And here's here, you know, sign up to this report, you know, give us your first name, last name, mother's middle name, and we'll send you kind of a, an ebook with some stuff, right? That sort of that world is shifting towards, reading, you know, real users review, really understanding the taxonomy of features and how it compares to other vendors. That's one of the reasons why, you know, one of our first investments that relate to was actually in G2, because we really believed that our users will want to hear from other real users. And so we we wanted to, you know, to give them the real evidence, not hear from us how great we are, you know, we you know so we wanted that that real voice of customer to come out. How are you seeing that change in the industry, especially with the broad level of trust in the society and the industry declining? Quite frankly, um, you know, will what's the, what's the place for AI in this, and what's the place for a structured platform, the traditional kind of G two architecture that you provide? Yeah, and no, I think Alex, that's a good point that you know most buyers don't trust sales and marketing messages. And I think we do a G two buyer survey every year, and I think you know typically, let's say only twenty to thirty percent of buyers really trust marketing content. And frankly, as an industry, we've been guilty maybe of getting too good at marketing and selling. And I remember you know when I entered the software industry like twenty five years ago, like Siebel, and you know, one of the original CRM pioneers was you know, kind of the hottest company in the world. And back then enterprise software was more like you would just build beautiful PowerPoint. Hmm. You know, and like logically, hey, here's this incredible SQL CRM platform. It solves everything for you. And intellectually it was kind of perfect, but you know, you'd sort of sell PowerPoint, sell vision, and then maybe two or three years later deliver the software. And so I think a lot of enterprise buyers got scarred by that. You know, and, uh, and obviously that's, I think also cloud and even Salesforce when they started, they always had a free trial. And that's part of how they disrupted Siebel at the beginning was it was just easier, right? You didn't have to, obviously back then you even had to install stuff on premise, but, but it was just like people were just selling vision and PowerPoint and then taking years to deliver it. And obviously software buyers got scarred. And, uh, and so I think, yeah, now, you know, 20 years later, I think the expectation is totally different. 
And I think also, frankly, the same thing has happened in hiring. You know, used to be you would just ask a candidate for their three kind of official references, right? And now we all go to LinkedIn, like before you hire anyone, Alex, I'm sure you, you also do your blind referencing. You know, you see, hey, who do we know in common? Who we worked with? Did you ask them, hey, what do you really think about this person? And I think that's also, you know, what G2 now enables. And for example, you could filter reviews on first degree LinkedIn connections. Mm. And, you know, see, hey, who do I know? And that's like true for you. You know, as an entrepreneur, you're probably going to trust your peer entrepreneurs the most. But like, if they're like, hey, this app works great for me, like you'll trust that a lot more than, you know, a vendor pitch. And I think G2 and LinkedIn together can kind of just put that in steroids where you can also blind reference the software. And, you know, before you buy it, say, hey, how does this really work? You know, does, do all, do they deliver on their marketing claims? And I think this, you know, social world, uh, I think has just enabled that. And, uh, and so I think you really can't go to market that way anymore. You know, I think all the emerging leaders we see now on G2, at the end of the day, they all have really good customers, really good customer sat. And I really don't think you could build a company the way Siebel did 25 years ago, right? With just beautiful marketing claims and PowerPoint, like your product has to deliver from day one. Well, it's it's funny, and you know, obviously, Salesforce having sold Steelbricks to them, so we were very fortunate to have them as one of our core, cornerstone customers, and they they know how to adapt SaaS. But what we've noticed, and we even went back, you know, even though we were lucky to have this great enterprise client, we wanted to say, well, you know, let's let's go back and make sure individual users are going to be successful, right? And and we tend to enable, like, our mission is to democratize. Um, great content creation and great consumption experience as a result. So we we couldn't really accomplish that, and we had, all we had to do was just do a sell and do a ton of onboarding and heavy lifting, uh, you know, around you know a few enterprise customers. Um, the adoption within those customers would be limited. So I think what you're, uh, you know, one of the things that I'm really excited about is I think over time more than you know probably historically you started in mid market. And SMB SaaS purchases and the Gardner was still kind of in the enter high end enterprise. But I, what I'm seeing is a pattern that, you know, for real successful enterprise wide adoption in some of these large organizations, they need to understand what a real user's experience, not, um, you know, in the kind of a, as a, you know, deep inside the product. And that typically comes out from some of those reviews uh, as well. Are you seeing more and more interest from enterprises? in evaluating G2 over time, or has it always been, you know, already an interest uh, from enterprise vendors and enterprise buyers? Yeah, no, I think now, I think enterprises, you're right. I think you know, kind of, as you described for related to Salesforce, it's more user bottoms up. Yeah. Yeah. I think it used to be like kind of CIO, you know, kind of top down, right. Where the CIO would decide what apps the company was going to buy. And then as like, Hey, you users adopt it. You know, now it's like, it's bottoms up, right? And you probably had this at Salesforce where maybe you gave a couple of users, you know, they tried Relato first. They probably didn't sign up enterprise-wide, right? They tried it with some group of users. And I think that's what enterprise have also realized, right? Like, hey, it's actually better to start bottoms up. And actually one interesting stat is, you know, we've seen even 98% of enterprise buyers start with Google when they're looking for software. Wow, 90, wow, that's, that's and, and basically when they Google the first search results, they see, on any query, there is you probably right because you've hopefully yeah yeah, yeah. probably not always sponsored but the one so so the how organic. did you accomplish that how did you accomplish that and what was what was the secret sauce behind behind that I think that's you know everybody would want to learn a little bit of your secret there right and I'm not sure I have any great secrets on SEO you know but since like I said 98 percent of even enterprise software buyers now start on Google and that was always our premise. And because the reality also with the traditional Gartner model, only like five people have the login. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like the CIO and the CIO office, but, you know, but like many enterprises have a hundred thousand employees mm -hmm. and you know, most of them don't have that login anyway. And so, and honestly, it wasn't like maybe 10 years ago, it was more like people were skeptical about it, but like it kind of seemed obvious to us that, you know, especially the, the younger generation, let's say of employees inside a company, like if I do anything, I'm going to start on Google. You know, that's what I do as a consumer. Why wouldn't I do that when I'm at work? And uh, so I think that's that's definitely become true. But SEO, yeah, it's a tough game, you know, because as you know, Google also keeps changing the algorithm. But Google does say that long term, the best content will win, you know, because Google does measure, you know, obviously what percent of people actually click through and engage with the content they surface through Google search results. 
And, uh, and, uh, but, you know, but it was, it's been years of effort, but we did see in our initial categories, like the first category we built was actually CRM. Mm. Cause my first two companies, you know, big machines, steel brick, they were both adjacent to CRM. So it's a world we knew well. And that's what we used to kind of test, like will reviews work in enterprise? Will buyers engage with this kind of content? And ultimately can we monetize it? But in CRM, what we saw once we got to, you know, hundreds of critical mass of reviews of the leading products like Salesforce, like Microsoft, as well as a niche products, we saw we just kind of naturally started to move up on Google because a lot of buyers found that content valuable. And so good, and obviously I was having fresh content and where I was working to capture new reviews, right? So having fresh, relevant content mm -hmm. that the searcher, the buyer engages with, that's key. And obviously it's not just that because also a lot of technical SEO. Right. Yeah. So we have right now we have a you know our content SEO leader Ross Briggs. He's a real expert. You know, so we're always doing both, like fresh new content relevant to the searcher, to the buyer, as mm -hmm. well as constant technical SEO optimization. And I think you know probably anyone that's invested in SEO, you have to do both, and you have to keep that drumbeat going for years. Right. Because it's not, and a lot of people, it's not the kind of thing that's going to work in a week or in a month, yeah. right? And I think the way around that is SEM, as we all know. You know, which can be great for startups when you're testing. But the problem with SEM, it's super expensive, right? Because yeah. all your competitors can outbid you. And and really all the money ends up with Google. You know, it's like the economic theory. Facebook, if you're really cheap, then you end up trying to use Facebook instead of LinkedIn. Yeah, or Facebook, yeah, yeah, or whatever you use, right? But in the end day, there's a reason that Meta and Google are the world's most valuable companies, right? Because ultimately, and it's just economic theory, right? Like it's an auction model, so all the, you know, economic rents gets captured by Google and Facebook when you're doing SEM. It's a great way to start. Like it's probably one of the best hacks as a startup, you know, to get those initial buyers, beta users, but you have to pay a lot for it, right? And eventually it doesn't scale well. And that's why actually at G2, we do no SEM. Hmm. We do only organic because, you know, we think long-term it's more sustainable, but it, it takes many years. And now we are top 1000 website. And that's why I think SEO content, you just have to, to keep pounding on media, right? It's a multi-year compounding strategy. And now we're, I think, you know, give or take a top 1,000 website. And we have a really strong domain rank. And so, frankly, now it's a lot easier. Right. Because right? we can put out almost any content and it ranks pretty quickly. Whereas day one, I think it took us like probably a year to start ranking on the key CRM terms. And obviously, that's also the other left and probably at the beginning, you have to start really narrow. Right. You know, like really focused on a couple of topics. And I think that's not just true on Google, right? But just in the world, because there's millions of startups. Like on G2, there's over 100,000 SaaS apps. So how do you stand out in the world? And on Google is you got to really be a narrow expert on one thing, right? And then evangelize about that, write about that, blog about that, create media about that. And then you start to rank on that narrow thing, right? That narrow focus topic. And then over time, you can grow from Thanks. there. And you got to keep going for years, right? And that's probably true with entrepreneurship as well. You know, I think now you have a lot of momentum, a lot of success, but I, you know, but all my companies, like the first couple of years is always like, oh man, what have I gotten into, you know, until you get that flywheel to compound. Well, so, so I think, let, let, well, let's come back to kind of a compounding in a second, but I want to double click on what you're bringing up with, all right, so you got the Google, that engine is working, but I, I, I think to me, what you're doing is you're creating a, uh, with AI, with more resources, with interactive demos, uh, which we're excited to participate in, um, you're creating a destination, right? And so once you do land there from Google or you bookmark G2, because you know this is, if you're, you know, if you're like in B2B marketing, you're always looking for new tools, you probably like will go and search and evaluate something and we love by the way the g2 buyers because they are educated right like just to kind of a compliment you know, they're like that we are a small team we don't have necessarily as much investment in kind of pounding the pavement with outbound you know spam sequences or whatever you want to call it and what we love is the g2 user they're kind of they're educated they know what they want they probably already looks for sophisticated uh, list of features and so you're creating an environment for those folks to spend more time to educate. What are you? What have you discovered about what really keeps people more engaged and helps them move across the buyer journey once they land onto G two? Yeah, and I do think you know the buyer they do want you know, at the beginning they want to be educated on alternatives, 
Mm -hmm. And we talked about this earlier, right? And they, they're skeptical of marketing claims because most of us in tech have gotten really good at marketing. You know, like, thank you. Like you have a beautiful backdrop there, Alex. Uh, you know, and uh, I think, but most of us, you know, have really good marketing, but the buyer kind of doesn't believe it, right? So they want that authentic peer voice. And, uh, you know, when you, now when you Google content- You can don't believe this 3D background that takes you in the 80s, drone air? Beautiful. Don't believe that. Yeah, <laughs> but I think beautiful there. marketing is now just, it's table stakes, right? People do expect that, right, from a tech vendor. They want cool, beautiful marketing and you have it, you know, but then they also want more. Yeah. And then I just your example, like I just Googled content experience platform, right? G2 happens to be the number one result, not just, as I mentioned, by a lot of work, you know, but then they can compare Relato to the alternatives. Well, first they can read, you know, you have hundreds of reviews, they can see the pros, the cons. And we also always say negative reviews are actually really helpful. You know, and for a lot of entrepreneurs, it's like, well, I don't want a negative review, right? But the reality is, and there's a lot of B2C research. It also says, you know, the perfect for conversion is more being like 4.4, 4.5, because if you're 5.0, no one believes it, right? Because, yeah. and we know this as consumers, even if your product's perfect, you know, you always have a customer having a bad day, or maybe somebody signed up that wasn't, you know, your ideal right. customer right. profile, right? So, you know, well, but then they want that balance. Vendor, it's helpful, right, to, you know, I think our ears perk up when more when we see, uh, you know, hey, I got stuck, or this was too complicated. And I think we learn from that. Uh, and I think, you know, as a vendor, right, like you really can't believe your own story that much, right? You need to to, to kind of drill in and understand, you know, what the customer's context is and, you know, where they're struggling. So I, I think yeah. that's another service that, you know, if right. you open this up, you know, and you don't really, like as a vendor, we don't control who submits the reviews, obviously. So it's sort of a, a right. very very powerful mechanism so thank you for that by the way i think it's yeah. uh, it's another part of the equation that probably doesn't get discussed as much right and another thing i think i've learned over the years as an entrepreneur like actually an angry customer you know while like i always as an entrepreneur i feel sad you know, when one of my customers is angry with me but i've also learned over the years that means they still care mm. you know i think actually the worst obviously i love the most a happy joyful customer you know, but then my second choice would be angry. And my third choice would be just, they don't care. Right. And they left. They never even. Yeah. Because once they, they don't matter. care, right. Yeah. Like, you know, so you've lost them. Right. But if they're angry, usually it means, oh, wow. If I respond and I listen and I make my product better. And that's also what a one star review can be like on G2. And I think what we always advise, hey, respond to those. Yeah. You know what I mean? And take them to heart. And obviously, sometimes you can't. There's also some one-star reviews where somebody's honestly just having a bad day. You know, we're all human, and they just choose to take their anger out on you. You know, and that that hurts. But also, frankly, the buyer can see that. You know, if especially if the vendor responds right. So having that open, authentic dialogue, and you know, obviously, if it's constructive feedback, and I'm sure you do this, but you can jump in. Hey, Alex, I'm the founder. Thank you for the product feedback. I'm going to work on it. I'm going to fix that bug. And you close the loop with them and then they can obviously update their review or not. But the, the other buyers will see, wow, you know, Alex and his company really care. They respond, they take the feedback to heart, they get better. And sometimes when you just get that crazy person, you can also put, you know, and like you see this in hotel reviews, right? Where somebody's like, like on TripAdvisor, oh, your Wi-Fi is broken. I hate it, you know? And, and then if the hotel politely replies, hey, sorry, you know, but you're like on your 1998 Windows machine and your Wi-Fi is broken and we tried to help you, but we couldn't. You know, then you also see as a buyer, you're like, oh, that's just a crazy guest, you know. And uh, so I think that there's a lot of and actually the other interesting stat is that negative reviews get read two to three times more. Hmm. And it's also, I think, just buying psychology as humans. You know, I think like buying stuff is generally fun for us humans. Yeah. yeah, whatever it is, right? Like, hey, I'm going to buy that shiny new car. But I think the last emotion before you're about to buy, if you're all excited, you're like, ooh, but what's wrong with it? Yeah. Yeah. When I drive this car off the lot, what's going to break before you make that final commitment? And that's where negative reviews are very helpful because you can see, oh, what's wrong with it? Oh, and ideally, that doesn't affect me. Right. Yeah, you because know, it could be some feature. Or yeah. Somebody's yeah. angry about some feature you don't need anyway, or they were angry about some feature you've since improved. And then they're like, oh, if that's all that's wrong with it, I'm good, you know, and I'll buy. So it's, you know, it's all about that authentic buyer experience. And, and I think that's also what we all have to remember as entrepreneurs, as sellers is like, hey, yeah, just how do I like to buy stuff? And how do I like to consume products and, you know, serve your customers that way? 
and uh, and then I think you'll you know, you'll win in the market and you'll win on G two. I, I think like this word authentic has come up, and I know you're a practitioner and champion of conscious leadership. Let's talk about that because I think you know it takes somebody like you, I think, to to kind of build a business like G two, which talks about being real. Right. And I think we aspire to do that. I don't know if we always succeed, but we like when we look at written materials, we don't want it to be marketing speak. We want it to have personality. We want it to have some sort of humanity. We want people to kind of pop off the page or customers pop off the page. You're enabling that in your world. But also, I think the way you're running your your business kind of empowers your team. And I've had you know great interactions with your colleagues um, you know, that they, they, they're just good people They're So what's the magic there? What's, what's, what were some of the recipes and how you building a culture at G at G2 that's enabling this authentic, um, customer experiences for your product and beyond. Yeah, no. And thank you for sharing that, Alex. I'm glad our team is being authentic with you. And, and likewise, I think you're an authentic customer because there are ways G2 can get better and you always share that with us. And, you know, we aim to take it to heart and get better. And it is really though one of our peak values. And you can see the G2 peak, you know, backdrop behind me. Mm. And peak, you know, it's both kind of aspirational that, you know, I as an entrepreneur, I want G2 to be the biggest, best company I've ever built. You know, and that's kind of, and I want it to be that trusted place where ideally all billion knowledge workers, you know, they no longer go to Google and mm. everything they need they come to G2.com. We're still a long way from being at the top of that peak. You know, but I think it's both like an aspiration and it's also a mnemonic for our G2 values. Okay. And our G2 values are performance, entrepreneurship, authenticity, and kindness. And so, and I think we've also learned, you know, I think as you scale now, we have over 600 employees. Like it's at the beginning, as I'm sure you've seen, right, when it's just you and a couple of co-founders maybe or a small team, it's really easy to all live the same values and be very customer focused. And then once you get to hundreds of people, you don't know them anymore. Right. And so then I think also being very clear about your values and communicating them also in a simple way. I think we found that to be very helpful. And I do an onboarding session with all our new hires at G2, where we talk about the peak values and why they're so important and why we want to be authentic, why we want to be kind. And, you know, we do aim to role model that because I do think ultimately we can make the world of software more authentic, more kind. You know, by by having everyone very focused on customer voice, authentically listening to their customers, because ultimately I think it'll make all our products better, make our industry better, and deliver that P. You know, it does start with P. It starts with performance, because at the end of the day, we want to help. You know, we want to build a winning company, and we want to help our software buyers. You know, win in their life, right? We want them to have peak performance based on having the best apps, and obviously, we want the best entrepreneurs like yourself, right, to to also have G two fuel their peak performance. And so I think it's all yeah, ideally a very virtuous cycle. And, uh, and I think what I have learned now, 20 plus years as an entrepreneur, you do have to keep you know, preaching, teaching your team and ideally leading by example to live those values. So that, you know, and I think hopefully we'll have the problem of scaling it to thousands of people. And I do think it gets harder and harder the bigger you get. You know, how do you get your team to understand and, and live your values every day? So what... Um, you know, back to to your values actually, and sort of then connecting it um, to the broader theme of the of the company. So performance, right? Like it's the first one P, um, and people struggle with you know combining performance and you know kindness, right? Authenticity. Not you know, I think it's a it's a mix, right? And that sometimes you need to adjust. Okay, my performance expectations for this team, given where they are, given their level of experience is gonna be slightly different than somebody who is just at the beginning of their journey and they're kind of just getting, you know, their, their new entrant to the company, new, new, you know, out of college. Um, tell us a little bit about how do you, you know, what have you figured out from that balance kind of combining, you know, Super Bowl winning team with a team that takes care of, uh, of the folks that are, that are on the team? Yeah. No, and I think sometimes a sports team can be a good analogy for that. You know, and I think also people talk about can a company be a family? Mm -hmm. And you know, in some ways, not really. 
right? You know, because I mean, I think that the thing your family was, wins Super Bowl, right? <laughs> yeah, well, the family, the, the number one objective with the family is not to win the Super Bowl. Yeah. You know, like it's to support each other through life, no matter what, right? Through ups and downs. I'm lucky I have a great wife and three great kids, you know, so their performance is not first. You know, I think it's all about loving, kindness and supporting each other uh, no matter what, you know, and I think in business, more like a sports team, like I think for the season, you do have that feeling of family. Mm. You know, if you talk to any Super Bowl winning team or like Manchester City just won the Champions League and football or, you know, right now, Tour de France, I think you're you're in France right now, like, you know, Jumbo Visma, right? I think for that tour, they they do feel like a family and they're incredibly kind and supportive of each other. You know, but they do have to perform, right? And frankly, next season, obviously, Jonas will be on the team again. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, he's probably going to win the Tour de France. So the top performers stay. And the reality is people that don't meet the performance standard of the team or the company, you know, eventually they are moved out. And that can feel harsh and unkind. Uh, but I do think it's kind, especially if, you know, during the season, you're coaching them. Right. You're making clear what the performance expectation is and you're helping them get there because I do think that's very kind. Right? Mm. And hard feedback in the moment can feel hard and unkind, but ultimately I do think it's kind, right? Because you're helping somebody raise their game professionally, especially if you give them authentic in the moment feedback, like, Hey, on the next sales call, here's what you do better. Or, Hey, the next time you're shipping code, make sure you test it more thoroughly because I introduced a bug, right? And at the moment it may feel, and I think I'm the same, right? Like at the moment, in the moment, oftentimes feedback to us as humans, like we want to protect our ego. So it feels right. hurtful. But then when we look back, and that's, I think, the great thing with great coaches, great mentors, great board members, right? Sometimes they say stuff, Alex, like maybe in the moment it feels a bit painful, but then you reflect the next day or the next month or the next year, and you're like, wow, that was actually really helpful, you know, because it helped me raise my game and perform better. And so I do think ultimately, you know, the two, while they may seem like dualities, I think long-term, you can actually end up in the same place. I, lo I love the season analogy. I never heard that before. And it really makes sense, right? Because you're making a commitment. You're giving people a chance to, to, to be on the team, find the, the fit where they can contribute on the team. Um, I think that's a very, and you know, some players stay for multiple seasons and, and sometimes the company changes, the, the game changes, right? The priorities change. And even if people are amazing in one game, the second, another type of game requires you know, different, different capabilities. And so you kind of maybe have multiple games going on inside the same company. And so you right. start locating people. Right. Uh, so, so that's, that's a really great metaphor. I mean, you, you said that you, you've learned a lot from your mentors and, you know, folks like myself that, you know, here, heard you speak before at SAS events, SASTER events, SAS stuff. Um, we look up to your experience, five companies, so many exits. Um, what would be your word of wisdom to to a leader that's in an innovation driven business where you know pace of pace of innovation is rapid? You know what what have you learned? What how you've changed your behavior? Is there any particular type of advice that influenced you the most? Yeah, and I do always you know study kind of aspirational entrepreneurs that I feel like I've gone to the next level. I think one that's, you know, influenced me and I would view as a mentor would be Mark Benioff, mm -hmm. a co-founder and CEO of Salesforce. And obviously what I really admire about him, he's taken that company from, you know, zero 20 some years ago to now truly being the global market leader and CRM and you know, having tens of thousands of employees still with a very positive culture, still innovating. And, you know, so I think, uh, and I, I was kind of lucky my, Second company, Steelbrick, was acquired by Salesforce. And while I didn't, you know, I didn't report directly to Mark, I was kind of on his extended leadership team, but just also being inside the company, I really tried to absorb, you know, how he has impacted the next level. And part of what I admired about it, admire about him is, you know, it's not just building Salesforce, but he's also very philanthropic. You know, he has the UCSF Benioff Children's Hospitals in San Francisco and Oakland. He also owns and now runs Time Magazine and He's involved in the oceans and he probably has about a hundred initiatives. It's truly mind boggling, you know, where he's always aiming to have a very positive impact on the world. And he also has that metaphor, you know, that business can really be the best platform for creating positive change in the world. And uh, so I think, you know, he's always been kind of a next level inspiration to me. And I think for us as entrepreneurs, you know, finding people like that, that inspire us and that, you know, exhibit values kind of at the next level, I think is, you know, is always helpful to you know help us help us strive for our own next peak. 
So, so, and, and I, I think one of the things that I love about Mark, and I, I also didn't, you know, have deep interactions, but when I was at Stanford, I was actually um, interning at Salesforce uh, right as it went public. And it was an amazing experience, really shaped um, shaped my thought process. I saw the number of product launched when the company was still pretty in the pretty early days. And one of the things that I find really interesting is that while Mark has maintained this uh, core about being customer centric, like the customer company, um, they they keep writing new trends as they emerge in a brilliant way, right? When it was social, it was social. Now it's AI before it was, um, you know, the more, you know, some, some whatever is the latest change, like it's, or he made just to make it relevant to the customer. And um, while building out Salesforce is one of the sort of core platforms in the systems of record and sometimes system of engagement for everything you want to know about customers. So how do you think about that in, in, in the startup environment where maybe you're a little bit less resource, you know, able, um, but, and, you know, I would challenge one of, one of your statements with where the historical legacy has been, like you need to be really niche focused and you just focus on one SaaS yeah. startup. And that's been the, the case for a long time. But it, I think it feels like the world is changing a little bit where, uh, especially in this economic environment, people are consolidating some of their solutions, right? And okay. the end users don't want to use um, you know, 15 tools, if they can use one tool that manages to do certain three or four jobs for them, it sort of makes their life easier. And that's a bit of an approach that that we've taken, like, how can you build something mm -hmm. that's horizontal, but then highly niche and specialized in the spe you know, for specific applications. So how do you um, reconcile that, right? Like, was like, Mark has probably, you know, jumps from one step to another really well. Uh, but, you know, building out something that's more horizontal that ha gives you the capacity to do that is also seems to be like a valuable um, addition to kind of how you build software companies of the future. And you probably see the trends around this in G2, which it would be really interesting to see, you know, folks like ClickUp and a lot of other no-code platforms appear across multiple uh, categories was the same core architecture and the same core UX uh, for for consumers. Right. I I do still believe like you start with doing one job, you know, one use case. And I think you're right, like ClickUp now is in many. Uh, but I think most still, and I, because there's so much noise in the world, right? There are so many apps. So I guess my theory on it is at the beginning, you're not going to be the platform, mm -hmm. you know, and I think even when you started, I don't know if you were already marketing as the content or positioning as you know the whole platform. Uh, but I think I remember there were also like specific, they were like specific kind of, I remember when I first met you, it was like, hey, generate that magical PowerPoint deck for consulting firms. Right, you know? it was pretty neat. Well, uh, but it was more like one job. And yeah. then I right. still think, unless you raise a ton of capital, you know what I mean? And, and obviously I think if maybe if you're a proven entrepreneur, you could do that, right? But like, uh, whereas I think at the beginning, my theory is still like, you're better off. Hey, I do this one job better. And frankly, I integrate to your platform, you know, and one good, more recent example might be Gong, you right. know, and I, I remember meeting Amit, their founder, you know, a few years ago. And I remember like, obviously the idea of conversational intelligence, which we also then traded the G2 category that didn't really exist. Right. And I think they started with like, Hey, I'm just better at helping you capture your sales conversations. You know, and obviously now they're aiming to be really like a sales revenue intelligence platform, you know, that can help you forecast and really kind of reimagine, add much more intelligence across your revenue and your sales process. And, uh, but I think they started with one killer use case, right? Which was right. like record that sales call, transcript that sales call, update your Salesforce based on it. And then they've added many more. So I still, I don't know, I still think for most, you know, like I said, unless you have a ton of capital, that's still the way to start, but then have some platform vision in mind. Right. And even going back to, to Mark Benioff, I think at the beginning, he just did SFA. You know, at the time, it was called Salesforce Automation. And that's and that's why I called the company Salesforce. And I heard the story that even he told Gardner for like quite a few years, like, no, all I'm ever doing is SFA. I'm not doing CRM. But I think in the back of his head, he had a much bigger vision, you right. know, and uh, probably knew what it was going to be in 20 years. And so I think it's that balance as an entrepreneur, right? Like get enough momentum and get known for doing one job uniquely well in the world. 
and then you kind of earned a right to expanding in your platform vision. And but but I've learned like my experience entrepreneurs, I I start trying to do too much at once, and I always have to narrow it, narrow it, narrow it for a few years until I can start to expand again. And so how do you? So back to you now that you're at this expansion stage, right? You have an amazing business. How do you? What what's the next chapter for G two? Right? We talked started talking about AI, and how you're bringing that you know information in a way that's much more consumable uh to to your to your you know buyer audience what what how do, how do we think about the journey and how do you think about your own journey in the future of buying experiences yeah and i do see it now as the age of ai and mm -hmm. and i think ai is not just hype you know maybe like crypto two years ago you could say yeah that was maybe overhyped like to me it feels like ai i think could be that transformational you know, for G2 in our whole industry, it does feel a bit more like, I, I still remember like 1994, 1995, when Netscape came out with the first, or really commercialized the first, you know, graphical web browser and it would unleash the power of the internet. It does feel like this could be that big of a moment where we can reimagine an all G2 buying experience. Because I do think traditional enterprise software, all of us, we created these, or even like, you know, an information site like G2 is always very search-based, mm. based on your taxonomy, but you kind of had to know what category you're looking for. You, know, you kind of had to know, oh, I'm shopping for a content experience platform. Most people don't know that, right? They're like, hey, I'm trying to improve my sales pitches. I'm trying to make my sales reps more consultative. I'm trying to make them trusted advisors. They're not like looking for a content experience platform, right? They're just trying to make their business better. And I think AI, conversation AI, just like ChatGPT has shown for almost any knowledge you want. Right. You know, it's just a better conversational intelligent interface you can just have a conversation with, which is, I think, like what we're doing right now. That's how humans, Socratic method, we like to question, answer, that's the best way to communicate with each other. And I think now, and but computers, we always had to you know, either do like rigid search or even worse, do like workflow forms, fields, required fields, take them in the workflow, take them. a very rigid taxonomy structured approach, mm. which humans just don't enjoy. And I think AI is now the potential to, you know, on the back end, get that structured data you need, you know, to drive your business or tap into that structured data that can make you better at your job. But have that fluid interface. And uh, so that's why I do think, you know, that that's going to be revolutionary. And I think the other thing we've realized with G2 is in terms of our business, where I want to take over the next few years is, is also how, how do we monetize G2? And one right now, number one, it's primarily via marketer software sellers, mm -hmm. but we've also realized there's so many G2 data insights. So we now have a G2 data solution. Really mm -hmm. excited about it. it's a new product, but we're serving over 50 of the world's leading investors. We're also serving the leading consulting firms, Bain, BCG, McKinsey, because we've realized, wow, now we have all this data on software. And we can also give consultants, investors, an AI interface mm -hmm. to help them you know, understand what's happening in our industry, make the best investment decisions. And if somebody you know, like BCG, McKinsey, whomever is providing strategic advice on the software industry or on software buying, they can just use you know, our data, our AI. So I think we're really excited to, and we're bringing that to vendors now with G2 Market Intelligence. Mm -hmm. So that if you also want to figure out Alex or certainly bigger vendors, you know, the oracles of Salesforce that are in hundreds of categories, they're like, they want to know where to invest. You know, they want to inform their competitive and strategies or market intelligence. They can also do that with G2. And I think that's an exciting new, I think, way we can serve the industry and, and also make money that, you know, we're really excited to bring to life over the next few years with data and with AI. So basically it's leveraging like your unique proprietary database that you've developed to come up with new use cases. So, yes. so back to the B2B marketer, right? That's your your current kind of customer. What, you know, outside of investing in G2, which I back as a as a user and as a customer, what other kind of things would be you, you would advise to them um, to think about, you know, how to adapt to the emerging world? You know, what, what you see as kind of the, their, uh, challenges in getting the word out to customers, especially as we discussed some of those trends, right? Like PLG, um, you know, is, is disrupting some industries, uh, product like growth, or, or just generally the level of trust in the industry or that we over marketed or oversold some things historically, or maybe over outbound um, to some degree in the past. And, you know, people are building this rigidity towards, you know, pseudo automated, you know, pseudo personalized, you know, sequences. What's your, you know, you're a marketer, 
CMO or kind of you know demand generation focused, what, what would you, what should be top three things that, you know, you would advise them to think about? I think the number one theme I think that is continuing is this consumerization. You know, so always think about like, hey, you're the buyer, right? How do you want to buy from your own company? And take all the friction out of it, you know? And I think, I mean, there's the obvious friction, like no one likes gates, no one likes paywalls, right? And no one wants to be barraged with marketing or sales until they're ready. So I do think it's, you know, enabling that digital buying shopping experience, enabling the buyer to have a delightful shopping experience, learn as they want to learn. And, you know, then obviously I think the good beauty of digital is you can monitor their activity, of course, with their permission, right? But you kind of score them, see how they're eating up and then you know, reach out at just the right time with the right message. And then it becomes a delightful buying experience. And so I think it's all about, yeah, how do you just shape the delightful buying experience? I think our job as marketers, sellers is just, you know, to make it easy and delightful to shop and buy and try. And I think everything else yeah, I think is fading, right? And I think some people say product like growth. And to me, it doesn't mean you have to go all the way to like people just buying, you know, but I think even if it's just kind of product assisted, you mm -hmm. know, because a lot of enterprise solutions, eventually they're still going to want to talk to you. And I think that's very valid. They're going to want consulting. They're going to want advice because they have other platforms. They need to understand how to integrate, right? So there's, I think, still value in human human advice and not all products would just be bought online. But I think, you know, the further along you can get them trying it, assisting them and then letting them easily raise their hand when they're ready or, you know, seeing just scoring them digitally and reaching out when they're ready and then making it delightful. Yeah. You know, Cause if you do it at the right time, people will be like, wow, thank you. How did you know? Like, I just wanted to call you. You just called me. Thank you. Great. So that's a great summary for this conversation. You know, you're basically, we're, we as marketers uh, and entrepreneurs um, and product people need to to wear the shoes of the buyer, create delightful buyer experiences. And I think um, on a team level, right? I think if I would go back to that theme, I, I would say that you're, um, you know, you're creating a, a culture that for the right team members, right? It creates a delightful um, co-creation experience as part of the team. I go yeah. to, like I couldn't um I couldn't thank you enough for sharing some of this wisdom with me was was our customers uh was our audience um and thank you for building uh, so many great companies that you know I've used big machines at uh success factors SAP now excited to use G2 so just thank you for innovating in our industry and taking your lessons and and building a platform that helps all technology entrepreneurs to bring their products to market in a way that delights the customers. Yeah. Thank you, Alex. And great to be on with you. And also fun to be supporting your Relato journey and, you know, and uh, yeah, keep those amazing reviews coming. Thank you. We'll, we'll get at a few negative ones in there just to make sure yes. it's real. But, yes. uh, but Some of your customers will have a bad day and then yeah. just respond authentically and, and keep helping them like you are. All right. <laughs> Be authentic, be real, be like Goddard Ebel. That's my uh, my my recommendation for the day. Thank you again, Goddard. Thank you, Thank you. for listening in.